This is the DMT 1 to 1 show episode 27 on the 16th of September 2013. A feature on amazing radio from Culture Tech in Derry. And this week's show is sponsored by Sheridans at sheridans.co.uk. I'm here at Culture Tech 2013 in Derry with uh, Matt Jamison, uh, Program Director at uh, Amazing Radio. So hi Matt and great to have you on. How's it going? Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, I did the first session uh, this morning on um, where the music industry is currently, uh, which is a very exciting place. Um, I think that uh, the way music is generated and created and shared with the audience um, has never been more exciting, never been more challenging and never been more um, invigorated by what's going on. So it's really good to be here. And the show is followed by people from all all over the world. So uh, can you give us an idea of uh, what Amazing Radio is and what what you do? Sure. Yeah. Amazing Radio is a a radio station, uh, obviously, from from the title. Um, We play music exclusively uploaded to uh, AmazingTunes.com, which is our sister website. Um, and new and emerging artists upload their music to that site um, and we uh, play it on the radio and uh, if they decide to sell their music on AmazingTunes.com the artist gets 100% of the download fee. Yeah. Um, there are other things that we do for new and emerging artists through things like Music Sync and um, Amazing Instore which is our non-licensed um, in-store carrier for um, shops and services currently across the UK, but expanding um, to the States hopefully next year. Um, So there's a couple of sort of platforms of which Amazing Radio is one, all under the Amazing umbrella. Great. And so how did it all start out? When did the project start and and what what spurred its growth? It started um, in 2007. Uh, My boss uh, and CEO, Paul Campbell, um, set it up uh, based around if the music industry was starting now, how would we start it differently um, with things like social media um, in, involved in the mix? Um, and uh, where we are now is we currently have um, 100,000 songs on Amazing Tunes, about 13,500 artists, which are a mixture of um, licensed music and non licensed music. Um, we play all um, genres and all types of licensed and non-licensed music on Amazing Radio and on the Amazing In-Store channel um, we play the non-licensed uh, music um, so that's kind of where we are now we're obviously looking at the expansion um, the, the sort of logical place to expand is uh, across the pond um, from our UK HQ in America but we're also looking at Europe as well from uh, both radio and in-store um, profiles. Yeah, and, and looking at uh, uh, the growth of the platform, you've uh, uh, gone from having uh, uh, purely just assigned artists to actually uh, having uh, small labels as well join the service and, and uh, people that are not strictly assigned essentially. So, so how, how do you see that growth uh, uh, continuing uh, on the front of uh, uh, maybe smaller labels that want to get noticed and want to get that, that kind of attention? Well, um, <coughs> we obviously, uh, knew it would expand, but we didn't realize it would expand quite as quickly <coughs> and um, uh, quite as organically as it has. So uh, what we decided was um, that uh, we would make it new and emerging music. Um, and that enabled us to work with um, the smaller independent labels who maybe don't get quite um, a, a big enough bite of the cherry that, that they deserve. Um, so we do work alongside um, people like AIM, which is the Association of Independent Music in the UK, um, and uh, other similar uh, people in uh, America and Europe as well, um, trying to sort of build a community almost and um, ensure that uh, a new and emerging artist who's uploaded to Amazing Tunes has the best possible opportunity to um, start a career, to um, get their music heard, and um, you know, thirdly and possibly most importantly, to start making some money from it. Yeah. And you were talking earlier about one, one of your bigger success stories, which is Elijah and the Bear, who, who of course uh, many of the listeners of the show will, will already uh, have heard of or, or, or know. Uh, so h- how did that come up? And can you just uh, tell us uh, briefly how, how that story evolved for, for Amazing Radio? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> Elijah and the Bear are um, a, a great, great band. Um, I've, I've 
I've loved them since the first time I saw them, um, which was at the Royal Albert Hall. But um, we uh, did a gig with them. Uh, we, we do several gigs across the year um, at all sorts of venues. We, we, we get involved with The Great Escape here in the UK, and we're involved with um, at CMJ in New York as well. And uh, we uh, put Lies on the Bear on at one of those gigs. And then exactly a year later, we were doing um, one of our gigs that we do at the Royal Albert Hall, um, which is held in their Elgar room. And they were one of the bands that played at that. Um, and uh, now they are at the stage where they are talking to labels. They have the recognition. I mean, they're very good. Yeah. Let, let, let's not, let's not um, dilute this in any way. They are a fantastic uh, band. Um, and they're at that usual um, level of talking to uh, t to labels. Um, so I guess it's good to play the play the part in that. Right? Yeah, it's great to play the part in that. Um, we want more of um, more of the process. Uh, we 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 tend to sort of have a caterpillar turning into a butterfly and then flying off. We want to um, keep the butterflies in our own pen as much as we can. So we're looking at other ways all the time that we can offer a, a wider portfolio of. Of services to a new and, emer new and emerging musician and uh, musicians, um, so they can stay with the family as long as they can. Yeah, looking at the worldwide adoption of Amazing Radio, of course, uh, being available online means that you get probably listens from all over the place. And so, how do you think about the plans for expansion when, when you look at perhaps bringing bands in, which I'm sure already already joined the platform from all over the world, but in terms of trying to focus on on a specific uh, growth market like the United States, for example. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the United States is a, is a huge growth market for us, and it's something that we're looking at um, all the time and uh, making sure that we enter that market in 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 the best way possible and the most beneficial way for our artists, because um, we always have our, our artists and their new and emerging music at the heart of what we do. Yeah. Um, we're we're very keen to um, to be a transparent, organic growth module for. For music in general, um, so all of the deals that we do with um, Amazing in Store and um, our other uh, money-making uh, ventures uh, all um, have, a, have a have a deal that that um, uh, does lots for the artist financially as well as well as the company. So um, the, the expansion, as I said, is is uh, organically in um, in America and. Um, it's just looking at how we do that, whether we, uh, you know, set up an amazing um, a radio station in America, which is okay. extremely costly, yeah. or whether we do things a bit differently over there, because... Um, well, hire American presenters in the UK. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, we, well, we, we, we do, we, we, we've just done our, our biggest reschedule, actually. We've just hired uh, a chap called Strange Magic, um, who uh, is, is awesome and, and does his show from the old Talking Heads building. Um, in New York, and we've got um, Toby from Los Angeles, and we have uh, Mike Taylor from Austin, Texas, obviously the home of South by Southwest. Yeah. So uh, we can do that. You know, we can hire these guys. We can get them on on the air. Uh, we're using new technologies all the time in our um, presentation. One of our presenters um, records her show on our iPad and then sends it into us. Yeah. Um, so, so we're we're just looking at the best way to to attack America um, from the new and emerging music point of view, yeah. and making sure that we make the right decisions there. And then there'll be Europe and uh, possibly Canada and other parts of the world as well. And finally, you were talking about how being a small independent company and a company that focuses on independent acts for the most part, it also gives you uh, much more agility in the way that you uh, you can change things on the platform and add new features that perhaps bigger broadcasters are having a hard time to get their heads around or approve or implement uh, at a board level. So one of the things that, that you have, for example, that I experienced myself is that I, I reissued one of my old metal band albums a, a few months ago and I put it on Amazing Radio and then if you do get, it, get a play on there, then you get an email afterwards uh, with a link to when it was presented with the little snippet of the presentation and the song, which is great for bands because for many of them it's the first time they they uh, listen to the track on the radio and they might miss it otherwise. So, so how, how did you develop that and you know, do you think there's more things along these lines that you can implement that haven't been done by other radio stations before? Totally. Um, uh, nine times out of ten, a band will always miss its first play on radio, um, just because you know, they're, if they're jobbing musicians, they'll be doing 
other things while while they're trying to to establish themselves. So um, we're very fortunate in that our CTO is a uh, former head of online from the BBC, and so um, he uh, is a coding genius. Um, he's uh, fantastic in the way he phones me up on a Monday morning and says, I've had an idea. And then by Friday afternoon, we're doing it, it's implemented. Um, that's one of them. Um, we've now got um, uh, streams for online and apps and, and, and all sorts of things, all developed through his perception of what we should be doing, which is yeah. great. Um, and because for that very reason that we're not sort of, you know, owned by a big corporate company, we can just do these things, we can just get them on. We're looking at new ideas all the time. We're looking at new ideas for how we playlist the music yeah. um, and, uh, you know, almost sort of crowdsourcing. Um, so there are lots of ways we can be um, ingenuitive and uh, we're, we're, we're happy and comfortable that we can. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. And it's uh, amazingradio.com. Uh, nice. It's great. Amazingradio.com. Uh, check out the website. Check out the radio station. And you can also catch it on digital in the UK. Is that right? Yes, on DAB in uh, London and uh, the southeast and DAB in Dublin as well. Great. Perfect. Thank you very much. No problem, thank you. And now a short information piece recorded with DMT's sponsor for this show, Sheridan's. I'm here with uh, Tahir Bashir from Sheridan's and this week we're going to talk about live. And live is quite a complicated area because uh, often you have a separate contract for each of the gigs that you're doing. So first of all, what are the m main legal pitfalls involved when you're talking about live? Uh, I guess it depends on what stage of your career that you're, you're at. So uh, ultimately when you're first starting off, um, you know, the values of the monies around live are quite small, so there tends to be less formality around agreements around that. But uh, there's quite a lot of pitfalls. The bigger you get, the bigger the production of the of the uh, the, the, the the performance, uh, the more contracts you start start ending uh, entering into. The big pitfalls are not getting paid. How do you deal with that? Uh, not being able to perform through no fault of your own, i.e. weather or you lose your voice. Uh, what are the insurance provisions around that? Um, uh, and similarly cancellations. And then as, it, as the tour gets bigger and overseas, then there's things like visas, withholding tax. It's actually quite complicated. And yeah, sure. uh, I mean, I've worked on some of the biggest touring deals around the world. And in that, you've got you know, hundreds of, of agreements which you know, keep on going. Yeah, absolutely. And looking at uh, international, for example, what happens if you don't get paid in uh, Romania or in Italy? Like, it, there's probably quite a lot of costs involved in trying to get the money back. Sure. Uh, I mean, if you if you've got the leverage, then you do what's called you ask for a guarantee. So that's effectively what you're saying is we want a minimum guaranteed payment for the show, which you should get paid into escrow account, which is a separate third party account before you perform. And that gets released to you after you've performed. And then, you know, uh, deals are then split up between guarantees and net profits. So anything that's above the guarantee level where the sh you've agreed a percentage of the, the revenue that comes above that, you'd want to get a percentage of that. That you, the quicker you get paid, uh, if you can even doll it up the night after the performance and get paid then, the less chances that you're not going to get paid. Sure. And people are talking about live as one of the primary uh, income streams for artists uh, in today and in the future. But the problem is that most uh, emerging artists are uh, probably lucky if they break even and uh, most of them actually lose money on the first door. So how do you deal with that? How do you try and make money? Can you Im improve uh, and optimize your touring uh, uh, set up to make some money out of it. Sure. Uh, it's interesting actually because uh, making money initially is actually all about quite often about reducing cost. Yeah. So think about this, think about your, even your management deal. Think about how do you pay your manager? Do you pay your manager on gross for live or net? It should never be on gross because then if you're making a loss on your tour, you're still paying your manager the commission on that. Um, similarly, if you're a six piece band, that's an, that's an expensive touring entity. So how do you reduce those costs? Do you need to have, you know, six hotel rooms, do you, you know, do, how, how can you cut costs? So that's, that's important. Secondly, in this day and age with social media, the internet, it's all about making sure the venues that you play at are filled up as yeah. much as possible. And the artist has to take responsibility for that as much as, you know, the venue itself. So, you, you know, use your data of your fan base, uh, get that working for you, use interesting sites, you know, that can help get artists, so get fans to your, your site. Make sure you know who your fans are, make sure you collect the data after the event, so that then you can build on that for the next event. 
Um, knowing who your fans are for live performances is very important because if you know who your fans are you can constantly tell them where you're going to be and you can monetize that later on through merchandise etc that's great thank you very much until next week thanks for listening to the dmt one-to-one show and remember to check out digitalmusictrans.com for our weekly news show